there's a difference in joy and happiness. Happiness is very dependent on your circumstances. You have a good hair day, you're happy. You have a bad hair day, you are not so happy. You drive to work and you get a ticket on the way. There goes your happiness, right out the window. But you see, there's one thing about joy. It's independent of circumstances. Doesn't have anything to do with what's going on out here because the joy comes from within. It's based on who's in you. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Woohoo! Joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost. And that joy is your strength. That's what's going to put you over. The devil's goal is to get you and have his foot on your neck and hold you in a place where you can't hardly move. But you know what? My Bible tells me that the devil is under my feet. That means I walk on his neck. I have victory. I am the above and not beneath. I know the end and I win. So that's a cause for joy. You turn my sadness into gladness. You turn my sorrow into joy. And now I'm singing and I'm dancing. And I will shout for You need to get do some dancing in his presence. You need to shout for joy. Shout for joy. true joy they don't know true they know happiness and a lot of them aren't very happy even those that are it goes up and down but with him that joy that's on the inside independent of circumstances in the midst of crisis there's a joy there's a joy there's a joy because I know what he said and I believe it amen, amen. Hey, it's great to have you with us today. As you are seated, why don't you just shake hands with people around you. If you don't know their name, go ahead and introduce yourselves and you can be seated. morning welcome to WOC we are so glad to see you we're glad you're here 
If you're watching by streaming, we want to just uh, welcome you as well, wherever you are in the world. We're glad you've tuned in today. But the same Holy Ghost that's filling this place will touch you right where you are. And pray that you'll be blessed and get what you, just what you need. So we're glad you're here. Um, if you are a first-time guest, in the seat back in front of you is this card. Simply says, guest. Pull it out and go ahead and fill out the top. And then when the re we receive the offering, if you would drop the top part into the container, that would be great. And then the bottom part, you keep. And it says, bring this card to our Welcome Center to pick up your free gift following service. Uh, as you're exiting the building, um, to your left are some glass doors. Over the doors is a big sign that says, Welcome Center. There'll be friends waiting to meet you. Just stop by for 60 seconds. If you have any questions, they can answer those questions. But um, just stop by and uh, let us give you a, a gift. And um, in that gift is, are some coupons for the uh, cafe. So uh, we're hoping that you will come back uh, and visit us. We, we are firm believers in the fact that God plants people in local churches. You need a church family. You need to be part of a church family. We have an amazing church family here that loves one another, reaches out to one another, is there for one another, and that's so very important. But um, I always like to tell our guests, no two services are the same around here. So if, if today's maybe not your cup of tea, come back next week, it'll be different. There's uh, Just come back three times and then see if something on the inside might just pull your heart here and say, you know what, I think this is where he wants me to call home because there is no place like a home. But we're glad to have you with us today. If you do me a favor, if you have a cell phone, go ahead and flip it over onto Vibrate. That would be awesome. I would greatly appreciate that, as well as the others around you. Again, we're so glad you're here. And um, uh, you know, how many of you know what next Sunday is? Easter. Easter. Oh my, I always loved Easter as a kid. My goodness, my mama had my sister and me decked out. We had the gloves, the hat, the purse, all of the above. Every year, all the way. But if she was still here, she'd be still trying to dress me like that. So, um, but she's watching. But I would encourage you, invite a friend to come with you on Easter. You know, we've got some empty seats in here today. We should have no empty seats. If every person will invite one friend, one friend, and ask them to come with you, you'll save them a seat. I believe that this place can be filled with people that need Jesus People that need a miracle in their life. People that are looking, to, looking for hope. They have no hope. Maybe they've lost their hope. You reach out. Reach out. There's cards at the info booth. I think there's cards in the cafe, which brings up another point. Today is our one-year anniversary of our cafe. Wow, that went, year went by quickly. And for all you non-coffee drinkers, we also have other drinks back there. I'm not huge on coffee, so I like some of the frappuccinos that are back there and other things that they've got besides the coffee. But um, we're running a special, if we still have donuts left, uh, donuts, free donuts and a cup of coffee uh, just to celebrate our one-year birthday as a cafe. So uh, before you head out, you might want to stop by and um, pick up a donut and get sugar in your system before you go eat lunch. Every kid loves that. So um, anyway, we are so glad you're here with us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. You can keep your phones out if you want. You can give with these things now here at World Outreach Church. We're excited about that technology. How many of you came prepared to give your tithes and offerings? Anybody? Praise, praise the Lord. I don't know if you're even awake as, as awake as the first service this morning. But praise and worship, you definitely seem to be awake. It was good, wasn't it? Amen. Praise God. Well, as you're uh, preparing to give this morning, there are envelopes in the seat backs in front of you. You can also give by phone. I just want to encourage you. Let me read this to you as I encourage you uh, as you prepare to give. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, <clears throat> it says this. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And so as you prepare to give, I just want to encourage you that just as you're sure there's going to be a sunrise tonight, there's, or a sunrise tomorrow morning, a sunset tonight. If you see a sunrise tonight, man, I, I need to talk to you. I want to be where you're at. Praise the Lord. It is the first day of spring, and, uh, and so uh, you, these, these seasons are definitely going to happen. We're going to have spring. We're going to have uh, summer. It'll be here soon. It's going to be August. It'll be fire for the nations. It's going to be hot. All right, then we're going to get winter, even though we didn't have much of a winter this year. I'm really disappointed in this winter myself. But just as sure as we can count on the seasons, 
just as sure as we can count on the sun coming up and the sun going down, I want you to be encouraged that when you give your tithes and your offerings, you're going to see a return on that investment. Amen? Amen. There is not a farmer out there that puts seed in the ground and then just never goes out and checks his crops again. He knows he's going to get a crop. Amen? Amen. So as you sow, expect eternal fruit to your account. Amen? Amen? And not only that, you're sowing financial seeds, and so you can expect him to multiply that seed sown and get you more money back so that you can be a bigger blessing going forward. Amen? Our part to play is just to believe God, just to have faith, just to trust He's a good daddy. Amen? And so as you give, I want you to mix faith, knowing that you're going to see a return on that harvest. There'll be folks in heaven that will find you that you don't even know that say thank you. Thanks for giving. Thanks for sending, giving your tithes. Thanks for giving your offerings. Thanks for those faith promises. God is a good God. He's a faithful God. He's put this spiritual law in place. Seed time and harvest always works. It works every time. He's faithful. We just got to do our part. We got to sow our seed. Amen. Get your tithes, your offerings in your hand, and let's pray. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we're grateful for your word. Father, we're grateful for the law of seed time and harvest that you put in place and the privilege that we have to trust you with our finances. We acknowledge you as the source of all, every gift, every talent, every ability that we put to use that, that uh, causes money to come back to us. Father, we trust you with our tithe. We, we, we cheerfully give our offerings and our faith promises to you. And as we do, we thank you that just as sure as the sun's going to rise, just as sure as it's going to set, we will see a return on that investment both in eternity and right now in, in finances being multiplied back to us so we can be a bigger blessing. And we declare as always, uh, you're increasing us more and more every day, us and our children, making us a bigger blessing all the time. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. Good morning, WOC. My name is Jamie, and I'd like to welcome you to WOC, especially if you are a first-time visitor. Let's take a look at what's going on. We want this year's Family Fun Day to be our best yet, and in order to do that, we need your help. We need people who can help the day of the event, Saturday, March 26th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. with setup, teardown, registration, the Easter egg hunt, inflatables, cooking, and welcoming all of our guests. Sign up online or at the info center if you're able to help. We're also asking every family to bring individually wrapped candy that is able to fit inside of a plastic Easter egg. Candy may be dropped off in any of the decorated bins in the lobby or in the Wonder Kids area. Join us on Thursday, March 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. for an egg stuffing party. Parents and Wonder Kids are welcome to attend. Pizza and soda will be served. Sign up online or at the Wonder Kids check-in if you plan to attend. Bring the whole family out to WLC Park on Saturday, March 26th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. for our family fun day. We'll have lots of inflatables, fun boots for the kids, thousands of eggs to hunt, and a free hot dog lunch. Make sure to grab some invite cards at the Info Center. This is a great opportunity to introduce your friends to WOC. Let's face it, most of us, when it comes to inviting people to church, have a back and forth in our head. We come up with the excuses that they're gonna come up with even before we even start the conversation. Hello, I go to World Outreach Church. I was wondering if you would like to go to church with me. We have two services on Sunday morning, one at 9 and one at 11. We also have a midweek service at 7 p.m. But if you're sincere and really share from your heart why you love World Outreach Church and share with them that this place has what they need and it's a welcoming environment, we're a safe place that people can come and experience God in a very real way. It's a place of love and it's not a place of condemnation like a lot of places can be. Hellfire and brimstone! When you're inviting someone to church, you can talk about all of the fun things that we have to do here. We have fun. We have real pastors with real stories and real good advice that comes from the Bible. There's people in your life right now that are hungry and they're searching for God. Just be yourself. Don't go to work. When people say, how you doing? Don't go say, I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed going. All right, I'll talk to you then. All right, bye. <clears throat> Excuse me. I couldn't help but notice the uh, conversation you just had. Okay. Well, I noticed that you said 14.2 dirty words, and uh, can uh, 
fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? I think not. You, you should probably come to church with me. Shut up, don't do that. Just say, hi, I'm doing good. And that just opens up a door. Walk up to them, tell them, hey, what are you doing for Easter? Come with me to church. If every single person in here right now would invite one friend, our auditorium would be packed full on Easter Sunday. So what are you waiting for? Just go out and do it. This is the easiest thing, the funnest thing that I've ever done because it should be natural. Really, it's supernatural. They want to see people that are real with the Word of God. They want to see them having fun because they're going to come to a point where they need us. So just go ahead and have some fun. Invite people to church on Easter Sunday.
finished. You were buried in the ground, but the grave could not contain you. Were you Step into the ring. He went with the devil on his own territory. <laughs> like somebody said, Jesus, when he died on the cross, descended to the depths of hell to pay the price for me. And he went into Satan's own throne room and whipped him right on the own spot on that on the spot. So I can go in the throne room of God anytime I want. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, Paul wrote to the Colossians. He said, giving thanks unto the Father who's made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. He qualified me. He qualified me. How did he do that? He brought me in his family. Made me a brand new person. I'm a new species of being that never before existed. My passport's American. My stomach is international. But my citizenship's heaven. I'm, a, I'm an alien down here. I'm from another place. Thanks, giving thanks unto the Father who's already made me, able, qualified me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has already, he's already, past tense, he's already delivered me from all the power of darkness. I got delivered. Some folks run around trying to get delivered. Man, I got delivered 2,000 years ago. I found out about it in 1974, and my life's never been the same. I've been delivered from all the power of darkness. Anything darkness has got, Jesus whipped it and gave me the victory. 
who has delivered us from all the power of darkness and translated us. You know, translators, they have those that, you know, foreign nations, United Nations, etc. Translators will take a language that's this and turn it into this. I got translated into the kingdom of his dear son. I, I was in this kingdom over here where I was walking in darkness, beat up, beat down, sick, poor, and sorry. I was over here, and when Jesus came into my life, he delivered me from all the power of darkness, and he translated me. In one instant, he, he took me out of one kingdom, and he translated me into another one, into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm in a new kingdom. I got a new king. I got a new master. I got a new life. I got a new mind. I got a new spirit. Hallelujah. In an instant. This wasn't a 14-year correspondence course, man. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> Hallelujah. Instantly delivered from the power of darkness. I don't know about you, but I was kind of messed up in that other kingdom. I just said Jesus, and instantly I got out of that one. I stepped over a line. All I, all I have to do now is just, just turn at the other one and go, uh-uh, okay, you lost me. No going back. Uh-uh. No. I've heard people say, well, I tell you, I just had it better when I was before I got saved. I just had it better. Your memory is going squirrely on you. Uh, let's see. Sick, poor, sorry, on my way to hell, dominated by the devil, stealing all my money mess with my head, taking all my joy or born again, new creature in Christ, healed from my head, stop my head to the soles of my feet delivered from everything the devil's got, my God supplies all my need, strengthened with the might by his spirit in the inward man, hallelujah no, it's a lot better on this side and there's nothing the devil can do about it, I'm in, I'm in a new kingdom and actually I'm one of the kings in this kingdom, he's made me king, a king and priest unto God Hallelujah. And he took everything in that old kingdom and he wrapped it all together and he put it under my feet. Hallelujah. Somebody said, the devil's been picking on me. Step on him. <laughs> like somebody one time, they just took the bottom of their shoes and they just painted on their shoes. Take this, devil. Every time you put your foot down, you're stepping on what he wanted to get away with. Ah, oh, it's good to be free. It's good to be free. It's good to be free. It's good to be delivered. It's good to be saved. It's good to be a new creature. It's good to be right with God. Hallelujah. It's good to be blessed. It's good to be happy. It's good to be full of joy. Yes. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. We wear the victor's crown. We overcome. We overcome. Every heart thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. We wear the victor's crown. We overcome. We overcome. Every heart thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. We wear. Glory to God. 
God. <laughs> I'm not even going to have you come down here, but somebody just got healed. I don't know how to describe this other than it's, it's, uh, it's something in your digestive system where it, it seems like uh, it just it feels like you've got real minor case of hiccups. Uh, I mean, a lot of the time, not constantly, but kind of continuously, off and on. Others might not even know it. It's not like you can't carry on a conversation or something. But it's just like this inside. It's just like something, something just keeps going off, jumping in there. It's like a, it's like a, a case of minor case of hiccups. It doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like a lot to most of us because we haven't got it. If that's what's on your body, it's very distracting to you. And whoever you are, power of God's coming on you right now, healing you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody else, there's something wrong with your breathing. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, it's a breathing issue. It's, it's not like, uh, not like having heart symptoms or something, but what's, what's that they, they've got ads on TV for it now? CO, COPD? I have no idea what that is, but it seems to be, if I remember right, but it, does anybody know if I'm right on that? Is that correct? It's COPD. It's something to do with the breathing. Well, I don't know if that's what it is, but there's something with the breathing. It's just, your, your breathing is labored a lot of the time. It just, you just have to, it's like you get half breaths. You have to really work to, to get a full breath. And whoever you are, the power of God's coming on you right now. If I was you, I'd start taking, I'd take about five deep breaths right now. Everyone's going to get deeper. Hallelujah. And when you take the fifth one, wave your hand at me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is that you? I see a hand. I see that hand. Or are you just praising God? You pra- you're just praising God. All right. Hallelujah. Sorry, I'm, I'm not saluting anybody. I'm just trying to see under these lights. Hallelujah. You, after when you get the fifth, fifth breath and you tell a difference, wave your hand at me. Is that somebody over here? I see the usher waving. Can you tell a difference? Is that you, sir? Can you tell a difference? And you're breathing yet? Not yet. It's all right. It's all right. Just wonder. You'll see a difference. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. Well, one more time, we had to lift our hands and thank God. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, Father, we th- thank you. Thank you for your word that you magnified above your name. You forever settled it in heaven. Your word is quick. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you, Father. We trust you by your spirit to give us words to speak. As the apostle Paul said, and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Father, thank you. The gospel is a mystery for thousands of years, and now it's revealed to us. In Christ, we thank you. And and again, we trust you. Thank you that you always work together with us, confirming your word with signs following. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, uh, shake hands with a couple people. I know you already did, but do it again. Show yourself friendly. And then you can be seated. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise God. And let's open our Bibles. Thank God for the word of God. Thank God for his word. This is my Bible. Hallelujah. Comes in a lot of forms today. You know, on paper, electronic, all that. But thank God for the word of God. God hastens. He watches over his word to perform it. Think about it. Almighty God says, if you read that and believe it, I'll do it. Pretty good system. Thank God for his word. Now, let's open our Bibles to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah 53, and we'll start with verse 1. And um, at the uh, end, we're going to minister the word for a little while here. God always said he needs something to confirm. He doesn't confirm our testimony. He doesn't confirm our gift, our calling, our office, our anointing. He confirms his word. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> so uh, somewhere a little later in the service, we're going we're gonna to take time uh, about a, within about the last week or so, uh, God really began to stir me uh, this morning to have this morning to have a healing service to minister to folks that need healing in their bodies, and uh, so we're going to start out here in Isaiah the fifty third chapter, and and uh, <clears throat> first we're going to talk about redemption. Redemption just basically it's kind of a big Bible term, you know, 
Bible said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins over in Colossians chapter 1. Redemption just simply means I've been bought and paid for. It just means that I got ransomed. You know, you hear about all these things going on around the world now and other nations particularly where, where uh, people are, are kidnapped and held for a ransom. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, this particular group of people, they kidnap somebody and they, and they want a $5 million ransom or something. They want some ridiculous figure and the families try to get the money together because they have a demand and they said, if we don't get this, we're not going to let this person go. Well, Adam sold us out. Now, I'm not disrespecting him. You know, I don't want to get to the other side and have Adam come up and go, you really, you really got on my case. I spent 6,000 years listening to all this, you know. And, but overall, overall, uh, Adam um, messed up in the garden, all right? And, and he sold us out. Adam had a good thing going. But he disobeyed God, he obeyed Satan, and sold us out to sin in all of its after effects. And we were sold out to sin. So therefore, as in Adam, all have sinned, all die. And because of what Adam did when he missed God, that every seed produces after its own kind. So every human, <clears throat> you know, we're born alive to God. But the minute we get to the place where we know the difference, we understand the difference between right and wrong. And that's different for different people. Different people reach that at different ages. The minute we get to where we understand the difference between right and wrong, every one of us chooses wrong. Okay, the Bible said for all, you know, no, you're not an exception. Okay, now, for all of, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The minute we knew the difference, you know, I don't remember the exact day, but I remember particularly about the age of where I all of a sudden understood the difference between right and wrong with God, and I chose wrong, just like you did. And, and everybody has, so even though we're born alive to God, when understanding comes that there is a right and wrong with God. Every human chooses wrong, and that sin, it doesn't matter how many sins we committed, how good we are, how bad we are, how small the sin was. Well, it's just the one little white lie. You know, it just doesn't make any difference. The minute we made a mistake, we broke God's law, and we, we were separated from God. Every one of us were separated from God, and, so, and, and we couldn't fix ourselves. We might have tried, you know, after I got saved, I had a, a real good friend that I grew up with and <clears throat> I was back in my hometown and, and uh, we were just sitting in a place talking one time and I started telling him about Jesus and, uh, he, and, and he kept, you know, getting off the subject. Well, I'm trying to do better. Well, you can't. Yeah, but I'm trying to live right. Well, you know you can't. You've been trying that for years. <clears throat> well, I'm trying to quit this and I'm trying to quit that. That's not the issue. The issue is not what you do and don't do. The issue is not how hard you try to do better. It's not the sins you committed that keep you in trouble. It's the sin of not receiving the one who paid for all your mistakes. <clears throat> you know, my, my sins aren't going to send me to hell. The only sin that would send a person to hell is the one sin of not receiving Jesus as the substitute who paid for all my sins. God made it so easy. I don't have to remember everything I did. My goodness, it'd take years to remember all that. And then I'd probably forget a few. <laughs> so that's not what makes things right. That's not how I get right with God. I don't get right by confessing all my sins. You couldn't do it. It took me 20 some years to get there. It'd take another 20 to confess them all. <clears throat> and then what if you forgot one? So that's not what does it. It's not confessing my sins. It's if you confess Jesus as Lord of your life. Accept the one who paid the price. So in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, in other words, I, uh, you know, we, we see in the scriptures that we, we were sold out to sin. We've all missed it. We've all made mistakes. And we can't fix, we can't repair, we can't restore. We can't, do, we can't make ourselves right with God. If we could, then Jesus would not have had to come. If good deeds, good works, good religions, good living, if that would do it, then Jesus came to the earth and died in vain. No, we couldn't fix that. We had to be redeemed. And the Bible tells us we're not redeemed with corruptible things like, like silver and gold. Somebody gets kidnapped and the kidnappers want $5 million. You could maybe figure out a way to raise the money. I don't know. But when we were sold out to sin, sin needed something that nobody could come up with and Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, and the blood of bulls and goats would cover our sins but wouldn't wash them away. And so therefore, we had to have the sinless, spotless blood, and there wasn't any on earth, so God sent some down here. Okay? So God sent a redeemer. And so we're when we talk about redemption, we're talking about Jesus coming to this earth, taking on flesh, being born of a woman, but so he has a, a physical body, but born of God, so he's got royal blood flowing in his veins. No sins ever touched his life, never did. 
until he became ours, paid the, and, and, and became our redeemer. So really, he went to the cross. This is what we're celebrating at this time of year. We celebrate all year long, but we especially celebrate this time of year. We're celebrating redemption because I couldn't fix me, and so somebody had to come, and there wasn't anybody on earth. Whether it was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whether it was Moses, whether it was Isaiah, whether it was Ezekiel, Jeremiah, it doesn't make any difference. You know, Peter, James, and John. Nobody had sinless, spotless blood. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. So somebody had to pay the price. And so God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So Jesus came, took on flesh and blood, dwelt among us, lived perfect life, 33 and a half years, went to the cross, took my place and died, raised from the dead. That's, re that's redemption. But when Jesus redeemed me, redeemed us, who, who did he do this for? John 3, 16, for God so loved. The world. See, everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah. Saints, sinners, ever. I knew that before I ever got saved. I knew it. I just hadn't done anything about it. Uh -huh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 uh, says uh, to it that God was in Christ reconciling the world. the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him. See what Jesus did, he did for the world. When he came, he came for the world. What he did, he did for the world. Therefore, anybody in the world can receive Jesus. Makes it available. Doesn't matter how bad a person was, the most evil human on earth. Whether it's Hitler or Mussolini or Saddam Hussein or anybody else, the most evil people on, on, in the world, were, are, their sins were paid for just the same as yours and mine. And they could have been saved just as easy as you and I were. By just simply saying, I can't fix me, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Okay, so, so when he came, he came for the world. What he did, he did for the world. And so if, if we could find a way to find out what he did when he went to the cross, died, buried, rose again the third day. If we could find out what he did in what the Bible calls redemption, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the Father's right hand of Jesus. If we can find out what he did in there, then we will know because he's, God's no respecter of persons. Okay? Acts 10, 34, Peter walks into this house full of Gentiles, unclean beings under the law. He walks in there and makes this amazing statement. He said, sirs, I perceive God is no respecter of persons. That is a revelation for a Jew. They weren't supposed to eat with Gentiles, fellowship with Gentiles, go to the house of Gentiles, but God supernaturally sent him to that place, and he knew that, so he walks in. Here's a house full of Gentiles, and he got the revelation, God's no respecter of persons. Ooh, if the church could get that, if I can ever find one person that's gotten anything from God, I'm next in line. If anybody's ever been healed, I can be healed. If anybody's ever been saved, I can be saved. If anybody's ever gotten blessed, I can be blessed. Why? Because if God does it for one, he'll do it for all. He has no respect. Or he does not play favorites. Humans, most humans, they, they do play favorites. They got favorites and their children and their offspring and whatever. They'll do favorites. God doesn't do that. I keep telling people, you know, he does have one favorite, that's me, but I can't get anybody to believe it. So anyway, have you found Isaiah 53 yet? <coughs> well, we're not going to go there yet, but when we talk about redemption, it's really important that we, why is this such a big deal? Why is it, because it's the big deal. It's the focal point of, of all humanity. Okay, redemption, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus is where God took all the sin, iniquity, sickness, disease, poverty, fear, took all of human's, humanity's mess, and he, from the very beginning, and he pulled it all up to the cross. And then he reached all the way down to the end, and he took all man's mistakes, and he pulled them back. He went to, from the beginning, and he went to the end, and he pulled them all together, and he laid them all on Jesus. The sins, iniquity, sickness, disease, sin, and all of its after effects, it, it was all there. And, and, and when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible said he's marred more than any man. Was it because of the beatings? No, people have been beaten before. Was it the, 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 the whip that by his stripes we were healed? Was that that? that no. That people had been, Paul was beaten with 39 stripes. What was it that the Bible said he was marred more than any man? He almost didn't look human. Why was that? Not because of what physically took place, but because of what humanity's mistakes that God took from the beginning and all the way to the end, pulled them together and laid them on Jesus. All the sins of humanity, all the sickness and disease of humanity, God laid all that on him. Why did he lay it on him? So it wouldn't be on me. 
Jesus was not my helper. The Holy Ghost is my helper. Jesus wasn't my helper. He's my substitute. Holy Ghost is my helper. Jesus didn't just come to help me. He came to save me. He didn't, just help, he didn't come just to help me carry my load. Jesus came to redeem me. To, he became my substitute. What I deserved, he got. What I earned, he took. I got mercy instead of judgment. He took the judgment so I could have mercy. So, so if we look back at the, the redemption, why is redemption so important? That's the focal point of humanity. And if I can find out what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection, if I can find out what he did back there, then I can know what God wants for me. Amen. If he did it there, he went for humanity. I'm part of humanity, so therefore it belongs to me. And faith begins where the will of God is known. If I can find out what he did, I know what God wants for me. And if God wants it for me, least I can do is take it. If God wants me well, least I can do is say, okay, I'll take it. If God wants me blessed, least I can do is say, all right, I'll take that. If God wants me saved, my goodness, least I can do is say, I'll take that. Filled with the Holy Ghost, yeah, I'll take that. Why would I turn down anything Jesus shed his blood and died to pay for to give to me? So we talk about redemption. And uh, really, we, there, there's, there's, we get three really good views of redemption in the Bible, all right? God wants to make sure we get it. And, and of course, the, the best one we've got in the New Testament that nobody ever had before is reading Paul's epistles, yeah. Paul's writings. Because Paul, he wasn't there. He didn't see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was till he met him on the Damascus road. Yeah. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. He said, who art thou, Lord? Whoever you are, you are Lord of my life. So he didn't get it that way, but he did say in the scriptures that he was caught up to the third heaven and heard things unlawful to be uttered. Paul got it in visions and revelations of the Lord. And so Paul, he didn't tell us as much what the cross looked like. Let me back up a step. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those were, those were the men that traveled with him. They saw when he went to the cross and died. They saw when he was beaten. They saw when he was whipped. They saw when he was nailed to the cross. They saw when he was buried in the tomb. They saw when he was raised from the dead. They saw when he went up to the Father's right hand. They were witnesses of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, they, they saw everything with their physical eyes, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John can tell us what everything looked like with physical eyes. They say, this is what it looked like. His beard was plucked. They spat upon him. They called him names. They put a, a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed him to the cross. They took a, a cat of nine tails, a whip, and they, they opened his back up and, and bleeding. And they told us everything that it looked like. All right? And, and so that tells us the earthly price that was paid. Now we get to Paul's writings, and he doesn't tell you as much about what it looked like, but he tells you what happened we, 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 they tell us what happened all the way up to the cross. Paul tells us what happened from the cross to the resurrection to the throne. Redemption. Ooh, I'll tell you, that's good stuff. I wish we had a month right here. Just, we just camp out. And... So Paul saw, the disciples saw it from his birth to the cross. Paul wrote about the cross to the throne. Redemption, my goodness. You start feeding on that, it'll change your life. You find out who you are in Christ, what he did for you in his death, burial, and resurrection, the price he paid. Ooh, it's like getting born again again. But then there's another view. I told you we'd get here. There's another view. 700 years before Jesus took on flesh and dwelled among us, 700 years before that, there's a prophet named Isaiah, and God gave him a vision, and a vision, in this vision, he saw what, the, what Jesus' death was going to look like. He saw the gospel, and we call it, oftentimes call it the gospel in the Old Testament. 700 years before Jesus showed up, God gave a vision to Isaiah and had him preach, this is what it's going to look like when the Redeemer does come. Man, I'm telling you, when Jesus showed up, humanity should have said, this is who we've been looking for. No excuse to not receive him. No excuse other than having their eyes just totally blinded. But that's understandable because my eyes were kind of blinded for a number of years. How about yours? So we got to get going here. Now, so we see in, in uh, Isaiah 53... In verse 1... Isaiah starts out here, and, and this, again, this is often called the gospel in the Old Testament. 
He says, I love the way he starts out. He says, he says, what? Who's, who's believed our report? Who's believed our report? You know, not, not everybody believes it. You ever preached the gospel to somebody and they didn't believe it? You ever told somebody about Jesus, they didn't believe it? Not everybody believes. Many has believed on his name. To them gave ye the power to become the sons of God. Not everybody believes. If you don't believe, there's nothing God can do. He's not going to force anybody into heaven. But he says back here, Isaiah says, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Uh, those two go together. Who has believed our report? Well, let's just take this, let's bring this closer to home. You know, in life, you're going to get a lot of reports. You're going to get doctor's reports. You're going to get medical reports. You're going to get financial reports. You're going to get reports on your, your uh, retirement program. You're going, to get, you're going to get reports on the politics. You're going to get reports on the nation. You're going to get reports all the time. I mean, daily, you're going to get some kind of report coming in. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Except when you get reports that disagree with the Bible. And that's when you've got to make a decision whose report you're going to believe. You know, I understand, and I understand this. I don't mean this as a criticism, but... You know, for years I've had people, you know, come to me and say, would you, would you agree with me in prayer? Well, I'll try. What do you want me to pray for? Well, would you agree with me in prayer? Well, what do you need? Well, I'm going in for some tests and I want you to agree that I'll get a good report. Well, I finally started telling people, what are you going to do if you don't get one? See, you're wanting me to agree that you'll get a good report. You've already got a good report. You're wanting the doctors to tell you something that's different than what they see, and God's going to tell you what's already true. Basically, you may get all kinds of reports, but you need to take the report and make a decision. Am I going to believe the ones that are coming at me this way? No, no, faith is not denial. It's not burying your head in the sand and acting like it'll go away. No, faith isn't denial. Faith is confrontation. Faith doesn't say it's not there, it's not there, it's not there, it's not there. Faith gets right in the face of a problem and says, I know you're there, but I got a better report. The doctor says this, but my Bible says this. The banker says this, but my Bible says this. The news says this, but my, my God says this. And I just, I've just made a decision. I'm going to believe his report. God, I'm taking your report. Your word has been, you, you, you've magnified your word above your name. I'm taking your word. If you said it, they can call me anything they want. They can call me crazy. They can call me extreme. They can call me eccentric. Call me anything you want. But God calls me healed, whole, healthy, happy, blessed, pro- delivered, set free. I, I really don't care what people think. I'm not answering to them. And they're not the ones healing my body, meeting my needs, and setting me free from problems. They're not the ones that are straightening out my squirrely thinking when it, you know. It says, who has, believed, who has believed our report? And the next part goes right along with it. Who's believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who's God rolled up his sleeves for? In fact, the, uh, I've got a, uh, the New Living Translation says this. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? <laughs> I like that. Who's God rolling up his sleeves for? Who's God going to say, okay, I'm going to reveal, I'm, I, I, somebody's picking on one of my kids, I'm going, to, I'm going to reveal my arm. I'm going to bat for somebody. I'm going to show my strength, I'm going to show my ability, and I'm going to whip the devil at trying to go after my people. Don't mess with my family. Well, I want God to do that for me. It's all based on whether I believe his report or not. Who's he going to reveal his arm for? Who's, going to roll, who's he going to roll up his sleeves for? The ones that believe what he says. Why would he go to bat for somebody that won't trust him? They limited the Holy One of Israel. See, what he's saying is if you'll take my report and believe that no matter what anybody else says, no matter what your body feels like, no matter what the problem says, it's not, well, I think that's lying. No, if I decide to believe truth, how can believe in truth call me a liar? I may have facts, but then I got truth. I can either believe the facts and deny truth, or I can believe the truth and it'll change the facts. Anyway, got to keep going here. I only got one day. All right. Who's believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the... Now, that's not even the good scriptures. We're just getting started. Verse 2, for he will grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Those weren't his sorrows and grief. Those were ours he was familiar with. 
And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we, we did not esteem him. In other words, we didn't care. They hated him. They didn't believe on him. He came to his own. His own received him not. Okay? He, when he died, he died without a friend. He died alone on the cross. I mean, all this was going on, and we humanity, the one who came to save humanity, called us friends and laid down his life for us. We watched it. We didn't even care. Okay? The whole world celebrates Easter. They all take the day off. But how much of the world really believes in the one that made that possible? We've been to nations. We've been to nations. I remember, I remember Good Friday in certain nations. I remember watching parades on Good Friday. I don't know why they call it good. I, watch, I remember watching parades and, and people, masses of people, all dressed in black for this major funeral. And they're carrying this, this mock body on a cross down the street. And people are, they got whips and they're beating themselves with whips. And people are having themselves nailed to crosses. And all this stuff going on, that's Good Friday. Easter Sunday, nothing. Nobody goes to church. They're celebrating a death, but they're still waiting for a resurrection. Man, that's what makes this thing work. It's not just that Jesus died. It's the fact that death couldn't hold him. Grave couldn't stop him. Hell couldn't put a dent in it. All right, now. He was despised. We, esteem, we did not esteem him. Now, verse 4. Surely. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, surely, besides all this, surely what? Surely he. I'm so glad it's not surely me. Nothing I could do to fix me. Surely he. Boy, I like that. Isn't it interesting when he starts painting a picture of redemption, when he's painting a portrait out ahead of us or out in front of us where we, we can see what, what, what redemption really looked like. Paul later on will tell us what, tell us what happened from the, the cross to the throne. The disciples will tell us what happened from the birth to the cross. But Isaiah, he says, I'm going to tell you what happened on the cross, and I'm going to tell you not only what happened, I'm going to tell you why it happened. I'm not only going to tell you the pain he went through, but I'm going to tell you why he went through the pain. The end result. So, verse 4, surely, absolutely, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, that not, that's not real clear, and we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I will, uh, my disclaimer is I'm not a Greek student. I'm not a Hebrew student. I, I, I'm really working on English, okay? <laughs> so what I'm going to tell you, you don't have to just trust me that I know what I'm talking about. I will tell you where I found it so you can go find it, okay? I get it in the Strong's Concordance. You can look it up yourself. With those words where it said, surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Griefs and sorrows, most of the time in the, in the Old Testament, were translated into the word sickness and pain. And so, and if, now, again, if we had more time, I could prove to you that that's really what that meant. It's very easy to prove it, but we haven't got time today. Another time. So really, that should say, surely he has borne our sickness and carried our pains. Now, born and carried, like I said, the Holy Ghost is our helper. Jesus didn't come to help us carry our load. Jesus came as a substitute. Holy Ghost is my helper. Jesus is my substitute. So, surely he, <clears throat> excuse me, surely, surely he bore our sickness and carried our pain. Born and carried are substitutionary terms. He didn't just come help me carry my load. He came to carry my load for me. And like somebody said, what he bore, I need not bear. If I can find what he bore, then I know what I'm not supposed to bear because why would it be, it'd be ridiculous for two people to bear, to bear that? It's bad enough for one. Why in the world would God want two to carry it? What he bore, I need not bear. What he carried, I don't have to carry. So if I can find out what he's talking about, I'll know what I'm not supposed to carry. Surely he bore my sickness and carried my pain. I don't know about you. First time I heard that, I just wanted to run around the room and shout. I was so happy to hear that. I said, God, I am going to go all across the nation and around the world. I'm going to tell people, God's a healing God. Jesus is a healing Jesus. He took my infirmities. He bore my sicknesses. He paid the price so I could be healed. And I said, God, I'm going to preach that everywhere. And everybody's going to be as happy as me. You know, it just didn't work out that way. <clears throat> I've been argued with, called names. People wanted to debate with me. And I love that. I love debating on the subject of healing. I have a very good time with that because I got a Bible. I, it's not because I'm all that smart. It's because I got a book that is. I don't have all the answers, but I got a book that has every answer to life right in there. And so, uh, you know, I, I, to me it was good news. 
when I found out that surely when he's teaching about redemption, the first part he deals with is physical sickness and disease. Okay? Surely he bore my sickness and he carried my pain. Absolutely, beyond the shadow of a doubt. He t- when I found that out, it was such good news because I suddenly realized anything that tries to come near my body can't be mine because Jesus already took mine. Yes. Sickness and disease come and knocking on my door. I can run it off. I can open the door and say, you got the wrong address. See, Jesus took mine. Jesus bore mine. Whatever you're trying to bring to me can't be mine because mine's already been paid for. Mine's, anything that was mine, it's in hell now because Jesus left it off down there and you can't bring it out of hell and put it on my body. I've just decided not to take it because if Jesus paid the price so I could be well, least I can do is stand against something that comes from hell. Okay? So he says, uh, surely he bore our sickness and carried our pain. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, Isaiah saying, we're looking at this, and humanity's watching Jesus on the cross, taking our sickness and our pain. Humanity's looking at this, thinking, this is God getting him. He must have been evil. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. They, they thought God was getting him. And Isaiah's saying that. We thought this was about what he did. He must have been an evil man. He's dying the death of a criminal. He's on a cross. He's dying the death of a criminal. He must have done something really wrong. Jesus never made a mistake in his life. Sinless, spotless lamb of God. So when he went to that cross, it wasn't because of something he did. And that's what we thought. It was because of what I did. That's me up there. That's where I deserve to be. That's where I belong. And you did too. Don't look at me smug like that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so Isaiah says, surely he bore our sickness and he carried our pain, but we did esteem him stricken, smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But, now here's the real deal. But, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He wasn't wounded for his, he was wounded for ours. He was, he was pierced for our transgressions, one translation says. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He wasn't there because of what he did. He never did anything wrong. He was up there because of what I did. He's my substitute. All right? The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. Now think about this. I'm going to have to wrap this up quick here. Think about this. Um, You look back there, and, 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 and Adam was God's prize. He was, he was uh, in the garden, and there are three parts to Adam, just like there's three parts to every human. Three-part being. God, uh, Paul said, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a three-part being. You and I, we are a spirit. We have a soul, mind, will, and emotions. We live in a body. We're a three-part being. Every human is, Okay. Adam was, and every seed produces after its own kind. He was the beginning of humanity, and that's what every human is, three-part being. All right, so Adam had it made. Spiritually speaking, he walked with God in the cool of the day. Think about that. Man, he was not only related to God, he had fellowship with God. He walked and talked with God. He, he had a good thing going. Spiritually, he was, he was called a son of God. He was related. He had, he had God's genetics in his body. He had God's royal blood flowing in his veins. Okay? Uh, mentally, in his, his soul. He was in pretty good shape there too. The guy was brilliant. So how do you know? God brought all the animals past him and he named them all. Now that's a pretty good feat in itself. But I'll give you a better one. God ran him back past him and he remembered what he named him. How about that one? It can, I can see naming him. Anybody can do that. Just give it a name. And, but when it comes back by, you're going, uh, Frog? Uh, no, horse. Ah, something like that. So he's got this brilliant mind. He's got, a, he's got an infallible memory. Woo. The last Adam brought us back what the first Adam lost. Now, so his, his, his spiritually, he was alive to God. Mentally, he's sharp as a tack. He's got it made. Physically, there was no sickness on earth until after Adam's fall. Spirit, soul, and body, he had it made. He's, he's in the garden. His needs are met. God even tells him where the gold is buried. Why did he need to know where the gold was buried back there? They hadn't opened Woodland Hills yet. <laughs> or Steinmarked. But God knew Eve was coming. Yes. 
as well as the Woodland Hills Mall and Steinmart, and I better quit right here. I'm just... So, where was I? I lost my own place. Anyway, I know, I know, and I just need to stay out of all that. Okay, so, so he had it made, but when he fell, when he disobeyed God, ate of the tree of knowledge of good, did what God told him not to do, he disobeyed God, he obeyed Satan, he chose the new master, he fell, and first thing that happened was he separated himself from God. He used to be called the son of God. He was never called the son of God again. He lost that. Okay? He broke his fellowship. God came down to walk and talk with him in the cool of the day. And he said, Adam, where are you? He said, I hid myself. Broken fellowship, broken relationship. He lost that supernatural ability. Mankind, for the next thousands of years, mankind went from this genius with a supernatural memory down to, you know, just kind of living a normal or below lifestyle. Physically speaking, at that moment, sickness and disease came into the earth. Like somebody said, sickness and disease is the foul offspring of its father, Satan, and its mother, sin. When Satan and sin got together on the earth, sickness and disease was the offspring. It wasn't here when God was all in charge. It wasn't here when Adam was the ruler of this place. It wasn't here until sin began to rule and reign. And that's when sickness came in. So that lets you know that sickness didn't come from God. If it was from God, it, he, there would have been one of the first six days God would have said, let there be sickness. But he didn't. And when he got done, he looked at the earth. He saw everything he made, and behold, it was very good. And from that day forward, that's the last verse of Genesis chapter 1. And from there on, God has never again said he looked at everything and saw it was very good. Why? Because Adam fell spirit, soul, and body. So Adam fell spirit, soul, and body, and God's not going to redeem humanity with a 30%. God's not going to do a partway redemption. God's not going to do less for humanity than what sin did to humanity. So if we can find what Adam had and lost, then God's not going to be outdone in any way. So God had Jesus go to the cross, and sh surely he bore our sickness and carried our pain. Then we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. That took care of the sin problem. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Jesus took all this chastisement. My goodness, read, read in the Gospels about all he went through on his way to the cross and on the cross, look at all the harassment, the chastisement he went through. Why did he go through all that? So you and I could have peace. He wore a crown of thorns so we could be crowned with glory and honor. He wore thorns on his mind so mine could be made right. And now I have the mind of Christ. I have the wisdom of God. He's not given me a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. I've been set free from all the power of darkness. I've been delivered from, 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 from stinking thinking. I've been delivered from squirrely thoughts. I've been delivered from my mind going bad. The devil would like to play with people's minds and dominate them with oppression, depression, all kinds of other stuff, sickness, disease, and all that. But Jesus died to set our mind free as much as he did to set our body free. And then... It says in the next part, it says, of course, it says, uh, uh, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The next part says, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes. So in other words, spirit, soul, body. Well, yeah, but brother, you know, spiritually it's more important. Well, of course it is. But God did not require us to choose. Which one do you want? You want to be spiritually free? You want to have, you know, your body healthy? Which one? Or do you want two out of three? Adam fell all three parts. Jesus redeemed us all three parts, so God wants me whole all three parts. But that last part says, by whose stripes she what? By whose stripes we are healed. By, now, now look at this. this. It just gets really good here. Okay? By whose stripes we are, are we what we are. Old Testament are. But... When we get into the New Testament, we, get, we ought to talk like New Testament believers. We ought to talk like Christians. We ought, we ought to have New Testament redemption kind of a talk. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the words that are in their testimony. My words make a difference. Because what I'm saying is what I'm usually thinking and believing. If I can get this straightened out, Old Testament said, by whose stripes ye are. <clears throat> New Testament, he just changed it all and said, who is own self? 1 Peter 2.24 whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. Well, we all believe that. I've had folks argue with me over that. Well, yes, I'm, yes, I know I'm saved. I know my sins are forgiven. I know I'm a new creature in Christ. I know that. Yeah, 
Then he puts a comma in there and says, by whose stripes you were healed. Okay? Well, brother, you know, God's just talking about spiritual healing. I beg your pardon? I've had people tell me that before. Well, God's just talking about spiritual healing. He doesn't mean physical healing. Well, who made you the authority? Besides that. Now, I'm not being mean. But sometimes you have to find sacred cows and kick them over. Oh, that, you know, that doesn't mean physical healing. That's just spiritual healing. Well, you know, last I checked, my Bible didn't say I was sick in sin. My Bible said I was dead in sin. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins hath he made alive. Didn't say, he, didn't say I was sick and he healed me. He said I was dead and he resurrected me. I didn't get spiritually healed. I got spiritually born again. Once I got born again, my spirit doesn't need to be healed. My mind needs to be renewed. My body might need to be healed. But I tell you, once I got born again, I went from death to life. I didn't go from sick to well on the inside. Jesus didn't heal me spiritually. Jesus made me a new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a healed creature. No, he's a new creature. So when he's talking about healing, he's not talking about some spiritual something, something by whose stripes we were healed. He's talking about physical healing in our bodies. Whose own self bear our sins, there's the sin deal, in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24. That we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, that's our lifestyle, that's our walk with God, by whose stripes you were healed. Now, the part we're looking for is that word were. Isaiah said we are, Peter said we were. Isaiah said we are, in other words, the price will be paid and you'll be able to get it down the road. New Testament looks back and says not, it's not any more that we can be, will be, might be, should be, could be, it's were be. I, see, I, so often I'm trying to get what Jesus already got. Oh, Jesus healed my body. Jesus going, I took care of that. Oh, deliver me from the power. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks unto the Father who's already made us, equipped us, made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who has already delivered? Who has already? Who has already? I've watched people for years running around trying to get delivered. I found years ago, Colossians 1 says, I'm not, I don't have to get it. I don't try to get it. Jesus delivered me. The minute I made Jesus Lord in my life, I got delivered from all the power of darkness. I was, tra- I was delivered from the power of darkness and translated into his kingdom. Does that mean you won't have opportunities to not believe that? No, that's why you got to decide whose report you're going to believe. Hallelujah. Well, we've gone long enough. We could spend weeks on this. But if we can find out what's in redemption, then we know what belongs to us. And if redemption contains freedom for me spiritually, freedom for me mentally, and freedom for me physically, if that's what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection, then that's what belongs to you and me. I may not have it working in my life. I may not have it working in my body. But that's my goal. I'm going after it. I'm not going to sit back and wander like a beggar through the heat and the cold, I'm going to find out what belongs to me, and I'm going to press in and find, I'm going to do everything I can do to walk in what he, if he shed his blood and die for me, least I can do is figure out how to get walking in that. Now, that's not criticism for anybody. Don't misunderstand me. This is not condemnation for anything or anybody. This is saying, let's rise up. I'd rather shoot for 100% and get 70 than shoot for nothing and get all of it. You know, we all got growing room. Nobody's arrived yet. We're all still pressing in. But if we don't know what belongs to us, we're not, we won't press into it. God wants us well. And I'm going to finish with that. We're going to stand to our feet now. And um, if you, uh, healing belongs to us. Your healing was bought and paid for 2,000 years ago. You're not a sick person trying to get healed. You're a healed person. The devil's been trying to make sick. You need to look from the correct side of redemption by whose stripes she were. Christ has already delivered us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. By whose stripes I was healed. Price has already been paid. So, if you need healing in your body, you know, you may not, to ha- you may not have to have hands laid on. You can just reach out and take it yourself. That's great. But if you'd like to have hands laid on for healing, that's one way, not the only way, but it's one way God heals. If you'd like hands laid on for healing, just wave your hand at me. All right? If that's you, if you just step out into the aisle, I can't heal you, but I'll tell you what, I can lay hands on you in Jesus' name. And I'll be expecting and believing God with you for the power of God to flow into your body from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, affect a healing and a cure. The anointing is what destroys the oak.
we might as well get ready. It'd be a slap in the face to redemption if we didn't have a mighty healing revival before Jesus comes back. Something big coming. Sometimes you get in prayer, you get a glimpse of the future. My, 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 my. Hallelujah. Oh, oh, oh. glory to God. Praise God. We might as well get used to hearing more about this and experiencing it more. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. Babe, if you'd just join me down. I'm going to have Pastor Janet join me. I probably won't ask you what's wrong with you. If I was healing you, I might. But I'm not healing you. I'm just laying hands on you. So I probably won't ask you what's wrong. I'll probably just come by and lay hands on you and command your body to be well. Command your body to line up with the will and plan of God. Yeah, but I thought God wanted to use sickness to teach me. Well, how's that working? What are you learning? Well, I'm learning patience. There are easier ways. No. Patience, I'm, I'm sorry, sickness and disease is not the teacher of the church. 14th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said that when the Holy Ghost has come, he'll teach you all things. If he's going to teach you all things, what's left, what's not, in, what's not included in all that you're supposed to learn by being sick? Somebody forgot to tell God that there are certain things you can't learn by the Holy Ghost. You've got to learn it through sickness. Somebody forgot to tell God. Boy, couldn't we help him? No. No. Yeah, but sickness is here to perfect me. Well, we know that's not working. If sickness was the perfecter of the church, the church would be all be perfect by now. No, sickness is not the perfecter. The Bible said, 1 Timothy, what, 3.16, I think it is, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished all good works. We got the Holy Ghost to teach us, and we got the Bible to correct, perfect, and mature us. If we let those two do their job, then sickness and disease has no part or, or no parcel in our being. So we're going to come by. We're going to come by and let's start over here, babe. We're going to come by and lay hands on you. Command your body to be well in the name of Jesus. Thank God for the name. If everybody else, if you just reach your hands out, just, just join us in faith here. Thank you, dear Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. That's where you're at. Good. You're ready to take something, let God do something for you? Good. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brother. Command his body to be well, his mind to be whole, his being to be sur surcharged with your power and your might. Thank you, Lord, for ministering to him today. May he never be the same in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Thank you for giving him a fresh start. Thank you for healing his body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for healing my brother from the top of his head.
has to happen. Number one, either there's an instant miracle. I mean, pain goes, symptoms leave. Everything's instantly better. I love instant miracles, instant healings. I love those. But really, a lot of times in the church world, you know, you know we see more of those. At this point, anyway, we see more of those in frontier evangelism where God's advertising to the lost and, and it's divine advertisement. A lot of times in the church, God appreciates faith. When we take it and say, I don't necessarily feel a whole lot better, but I'm going to do the, like, the, like the 10 lepers in Luke 17, and I'm going to go my way believing I got it, and the 10 lepers were healed as they went. It's just as scriptural as instant. And then fourth chapter of Mark, uh, John's gospel, and the nobleman's son, the Bible said he began to amend from that hour. So either it's instant as you go, or you just be an amending process. But from the minute hands are laid on you in the name of Jesus, the power of God goes into your body. And if you'll just stay hooked up with that, if you'll just say, it's working in me, it's working, the power of God's working in me, healing belongs to me, the power of God's working in me, it's been administered to me, the anointing breaks the yoke, God's, God's got his power working in me, and, 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 and I may not have felt anything instantly, but if I didn't, it doesn't make any difference. I'm like those lepers, I'm, I'm healed as I go. I've seen a lot of people leave meetings and come back three days later, and when they come back, they're totally well. Somebody says, why does it take time? I don't know. I just know that faith pleases God. Well, what if I just begin to amend? The way I see it, I don't care if it's instant as I go or if I begin to amend. I don't really care as long as I get better. Taking a few days to get better is a whole lot better than not getting better at all. So we ought to lift our hands corporately and thank God. Thank you, Lord. Ah, oh, we thank you, Father. Thank you, the anointing's working in us. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, affecting a healing and a cure from the top of our heads to the bottoms of our feet. In Jesus' name, we rejoice and thank you for it. Hallelujah. While you got your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm just my life's not right with God. I, I need to get some things right. I've either never been saved at all or I prayed a prayer one time and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm lukewarm. I've, I've slidden back. I'm, I'm, I have not maintained my walk with God, but just the bottom line, things aren't right between God and me right now. And I want to get that fixed before I leave here. If that's you, wave your hand at me. Say, pray for me. I want to get some things right. Good, thank you, sir. Who else? Pray for me. My, th things aren't right between God and me. I want to get it right before I leave here. Anybody else? Say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm lukewarm at best. My goodness, I got saved one time, but I tell you, I've just been away. I'm so, I'm, I, I don't pray anymore. I don't read my Bible anymore. I'm lukewarm toward God. I want to get that fixed, and I want to do it today. Anyone else? Any, anyone else? Okay, good, good, thank you. Anybody else? I want to get my life right with God. Most important thing in the world is my relationship with Him. Everything else, everything else is the ripple effect off of that. Anybody else? Maybe you'd say, well, I know, I'm, I know I'm saved. I'm right with God. But I just really have a sense I need more, I need more power in my life. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want, I want what they got on the day of Pentecost. I want, I want that, that power in my life. Like, be filled with God's Spirit and have a, this wonderful heavenly language where I can speak divine secrets to God in prayer. Anybody here say, I, I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. I want that power in my life. Anybody here? Okay. 
think I think there's a hand here somewhere. I'm seeing the ushers pointing. Okay, good, good. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Say, that's me. That's me. I want that power in my life. I want, I want to be filled with the Spirit of God. I need a, I need a good dose of his, his power in my life, more than I got right now. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, that's you. Raise your hand up. I'll pray for, I want to pray for you. Good. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? All right. If you'd look up here at me, please. If, you'd, if you raised your hand, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come up and say something publicly or whatever. I want to pray for you. If you raised your hand, even if you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, wish you would have, if you'd just make your way out into the aisle, come meet me down here in the front. I want to pray for you. Okay? Hallelujah. Here comes a hungry man right here. Is there anybody else? We'll wait for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, everybody, if you just, again, just reach your hands out here. We're just going to, we're going to pray. Father, I thank you for these that have come to receive from you, and they'll not be disappointed. You never turn anybody down. You never criticize them for where they've been or what they've done, or it doesn't make any difference. You're ready to just take them in and give them a brand new, fresh start. Fill them with your spirit. Change their walk. Change their life. I ask you for that, dear Father. I ask you to do that. May this be a may this be a life-changing time. May this be a pivotal point in their lives. And I ask you for that. We ask you. We as a church ask you for that. And we we trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I could lead you in a prayer up here, and that'd be really good. But I want to make sure you got what you came for. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to follow this gentleman right here. He's just going to share a couple of verses with you and lead you in a prayer. Just make sure you got what you came for. And out here, we're going to be praying and believing God with you for you to get exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, let's give him a hand. Hallelujah. Now we ought to lift a hand up toward heaven and thank God for, thank God for meeting them in that prayer room. Lord, may they never be the same in Jesus' name. Father, whatever needs they've got, thank you for meeting those needs. May their walk with you from today on be different than anything they've ever had before. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God.